yeah, I think the, the, the one of the most important uh, things to 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 um, have in the analysis of the welfare state is to understand how it came to be, because it it was the result of a very specific historic compromise between labor and capital, which was developed in the middle of the last century. So. Uh, one of the interesting points I mentioned yesterday was that uh, the, the welfare st the entire notion of the welfare state didn't exist before the welfare state existed, because what the trade union and labor movement fought for was actually socialism, and uh, they didn't achieve that. But what they did achieve was a, a sort of a, a compromise with capital, in which in which uh, employers and capital owners gave in to a lot of the demands from the labor movement and in this way they achieved a lot of social progress through the welfare state but uh, on the other on the other hand uh, the welfare state is not the final solution of the social problems in society it is uh, a compromise it is uh, sort of a compensating for deficiencies in the capitalist economy in many areas. So uh, this dual uh, characteristic of the welfare state I think is very important. And it's important also in order to, to understand what is happening today when the employers and capital owners had withdrawn from the class compromise and started to attack what they previously accepted in the name of the compromise. But it seems to me, and I think the experience we have from these sort of movements is they are very, they have a very short term. It's very difficult to keep on a very high level of mobilization over time if you don't have a structure and organization and so on. And uh, the other thing is that maybe they are not strong enough either to challenge the, or, or our adversaries because there is, we have a very, very strong interest on the other side. Uh, international capital, these uh, multinational companies, they are very, very well organized. So if you really want to defeat financial capital, is to want to defeat the enormous power of these economic bodies, you have to have a very, very well organized and structured organization. But of course, uh, it benefits the struggle if at the same time, when we mobilize, also are able to mobilize broader and bring new people in. So it is very important to have these more spontaneous uh, organizations and mobilizations, but there will never be enough. When I, when I say that the trade unions must be more, more political, it, it comes out from the current situation. And a situation which is characterized by labor parties and, uh, and other parties in the labor movement, uh, where they are in, in a deep political and ideological crisis. So they cannot, they cannot fill the role which they should do. So in compensating for that, uh, partly, I think it is important that the trade union movement become more political themselves, not party political in linking up the party to political parties, because quite the opposite, they have to, to, to reduce the links with the, these parties because they do not fill the role. So I mean that the trade unions should be more political in, in, in the understanding that they take like a broader responsibility for the social development not only wages, working conditions and the traditional trade union things, but take on a, a, a broader responsibility. I do not think that that is enough for, for the future. I think we have to develop new organizations, but that has to happen as part of the struggle. The new organizations, political organizations we need in order to, 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 to take the political struggle to a higher level. We'll, we'll have to grow out of the struggle, I think, uh, but because we don't have them today.
Well, compromises are, are both necessary and quite usual. Uh, every wage negotiation which a trade union do ends with a compromise in a way. All, all collective agreements are in a, in a way compromises between labour and capital. So there is nothing strange with, with making compromises. The, the thing with the, the more uh, the deeper rooting of that in, in the post war period was that this more or less tactical steps of, of, of going into compromises was, was lifted to a sort of, uh, of ideology, a social partnership ideology, which, uh, which, proved, which has proved to be wrong because they thought more or less that the, that the um, history with hard confrontations and struggle and general strikes uh, and lockouts were part of the history. We are going to you now develop uh, our societies step by step through reforms into the beloved land. I think this deeply rooted uh, social partnership ideology, it's that which is a problem. And that is a legacy within the trade union and labor movement. It is more first and foremost developed within that movement. So uh, it is not being uh, imposed on the trade unions and labor parties from outside. It is a thing that is developed in the, the post-war history in the labor movement. And I think we have to we have, to have very, very um, hard discussion, I think, within the trade union labor movement on these experiences. When, when the, for example, the European Trade Union Confederation now ask for, or, or I even almost say beg for, a compromise with, with the employers in Europe, that seems to me rather strange. You don't, you don't beg for a compromise. A compromise is established if you have two very strong uh, partners that are not able to defeat each other. You don't go into a compromise with somebody you can defeat, then you defeat them.